Provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 18, this meeting of the Board of Health is being conducted via remote participation. I'm going to do a roll call to make sure everybody is here and their audio and video, except Maureen will just be on audio for now, is working properly. So, Steve. Here. Tim. Here. John. Here. Maureen. Here. And Nancy here. Emma. Here. Okay. So we are all here and we can proceed. The first thing on our agenda tonight is our public hearing. And I have a statement to read. The Amherst Board of Health is responsible for the protection and promotion of public health, the control of disease and the promotion of sanitary living conditions for the town of Amherst. The board oversees health regulations for the town, including creation of new regulations, review of existing regulations, review and determination of variance requests for existing regulations. The Amherst Board of Health is seeking to update their 2010 regulation on promoting smoking in workplace and public places to the revised regulation prohibiting smoking and vaping in workplaces and public places. This is the review and revision of one of our three town regulations addressing tobacco and nicotine products and smoking and vaping. Um, the other two are one we revised in 2020 that is restricting youth access and exposure to tobacco and nicotine delivery products. Um, and the other one is smoking disclosure in multi-unit residences, which was last re voted on in 2011. The purpose of this public hearing is to hear testimony from businesses, residents, and other interested parties. No vote will be taken at the end of this public hearing. Written testimony will be accepted until April 30th, 2021. The Amherst Board of Health is a five member board that is appointed for a three year term. The board derives its authority from the Massachusetts legislature and the members are Nancy Gilbert, Stephen George, John Tobiasen, Timothy Randier, and Maureen Malay. Emma Dragon is the health director for Amherst. The health, the health director is an employee of Amherst. The director's duties are to carry out the wishes of the board, assist in the enforcement of our regulations, and to deal with the day-to-day -day operations of the health department. With the exception of Title V regulations, it is not legally required for the Board of Health to hold public hearing on proposed regulations before them, even though all proposed regulations are addressed at meetings which are public and, and the public is always invited. Due to the broad interest in tobacco and nicotine products and the, control and con the control of these substances, every effort is being made to provide a public forum. As the purpose of the public hearing is to collect information and opinions, the board will not ask for a vote from the audience, nor will the board vote itself on the proposed regulations at this public hearing. The board will discuss and vote on the proposed regulations at our next public meeting on May 13th. Um, as noted, this meeting will be public. However, the board will not provide time at that meeting for further testimony unless a board member has a specific question to which an audience member can offer some clarification. After this public hearing, the board will accept written testimony for a period of 22 days until April 30th. The letters can be emailed or mailed or delivered to dragone at amherstma.gov or the health department, 70 Boltwood Walk, Amherst, Massachusetts, 01002. If the proposed regulation is passed, the regulation will be posted at the health department office and online and will be publicized in summary form in the Hampshire Gazette within 30 days of passage. Because this is a virtual hearing, we will be following the following procedures. I will be co-chairing this hearing. Emma Dragon, as the other co-host, will be muting and unmuting participants whose hands are raised as they are recognized by the chair. Before we begin taking testimony in the interest of time, we ask that you adhere to the following ground rules. 
Before addressing the Board of Health, please be familiar with the proposed changes to the regulation. When addressing the Board of Health, please state your name and any professional affiliation you may have that impacts your comments. Identify the section of the regulation that you wish to comment on. Please limit your comments to three minutes so that other members of the audience will have a chance to speak. As noted earlier, written testimony will be accepted until April 30th and can be emailed to dragone at amherstma.gov or mailed to Emma Dragon Health Department, 70 Boltwood Walk, Amherst, Massachusetts, 01002. Any person showing verbal disrespect to others will be asked to leave the public hearing by having their voice muted. Thank you for your anticipated cooperation. And may I have a motion to open the public hearing? So moved. Okay, Steve has made a motion to open the hearing. May I have a second? I'll second that. Motion. Tim seconds it. And we're going to yeah. vote on it. Steve? Aye. Tim? Aye. John? Yes. Maureen? Yes. And Nancy, aye. The, the public hearing is open. Is there anyone who would like to speak? I actually, I'm not seeing anybody, um, which is interesting. Um, yeah. I have contacted Brianna um, because I'm just curious as to how there's no one, there's no attendees, which is yeah. strange. <laughs> So just wanting to make sure everything's fine on the tech side. Hmm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm getting some messages right now um, that are saying that there's a passcode needed, which is, Interesting. So hold on one second. Okay. Tamara Lord's name just popped up, attendee one, and her hand is raised. Do so I'm going to allow Tamara to talk then. Hi, Tamara. Can you unmute right. Thank you. Uh, the second link you sent me worked. Sorry. I'm sorry if it was confusing. <laughs> Do you have a comment to make on our uh, proposed regulations? Um, I'm just sitting in, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, that's fine. Okay. You want to get, do you, I can look at the email. It has the uh, passcode if you want. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, and I see Don, Dylan Maxfield has, is here. He doesn't have, uh, he's. In... Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, Dylan. Welcome to the meeting. You've been unmuted. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Do you have any comments? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I had um, a little bit of questions here on this. For uh, so I'm I'm over at the uh, the Board of Licensing Commissioners, and right now the thing where we're thinking about right now is going to be it's kind of dependent on the Cannabis Control Commission and what they're planning on doing. But we're thinking about in the future of what might happen with recreational marijuana facilities and uh, how we want to handle that. I guess the question here, because looking through your um, draft regulations, it doesn't say anything about marijuana. It specifically says tobacco and banning smoke shops such as you know cigar bars or hookah bars. Um, was this specifically intended to to give leeway to? Um, the marijuana recreational facilities in the future, or was that just not a consideration of these uh, regulations? At this point, it was not a consideration of these regulations, but if there was any motion to have a marijuana bar, we would look into having regulations on those. Okay. Um, and I guess just my, my second question on any of this was, uh, how how was it operating in, in the past that something like the VFW, uh, which is now closed, but were they allowed for smoking inside? Was it just because Amherst had never said anything specifically about that? And these regulations are now actually speaking to that? Yeah, it was always a, um, a discussion with mm -hmm. the former 
um, director of the health department and they closed, so it took, took it away. So we didn't have to address it any farther when they closed. But it, it, it was a private club by membership only. Okay, so just so, just so I understand, sorry to jump so late into this, uh, this conversation, you guys are really coming to the end of this. But uh, so this doesn't uh, affect specifically private clubs um, it, but it just affects all all other businesses. I'm correct about that. Yes, and if it's a private club, there has to be a membership, and and only members can be present. Okay. Awesome. Well, yeah. And that's... a membership fee, so it wasn't. Oh, I just want. And it was. And it was a X amount of time that the membership had to be in existence. You can't just join for one day, go and participate, and then unjoin. Yeah. Okay, cool. That that. Yeah, would everybody were were any of you others when we did the the two thousand and uh, ten version of this? Were any of you on the board then? No, just me. Okay. Did that answer your question, Dylan? Uh, yes, yes, it did. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for doing this. Is uh. This, you know, we all say appreciate the uh, the work you guys put into all this. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like me to read the passcode just in case anyone is listening and needs it. So the passcode, if you needed to log on and you can't get in, is 808-532. Thank you, Steve. See, Ed Smith's in, but I don't know if he wants to talk. Yeah, uh... Hi, I just joined. I'm on my way to my home office. Okay. I don't know context. So do you have a question, Ed, on the the uh, prohibiting smoking and vaping in workplaces and public places? I don't have a question yet, no. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, do, so that would be the end of the meeting if we have no other attendees to ask any questions. And we have it on our agenda for, whoops. How long do we have the bit on our agenda? Let's see, here it is. To 5.20, what time is it? 5.14, so we have seven more minutes. We need to keep the meeting open, so. All right. I wonder if we can keep the meeting open and discuss anything. It's a hand raised. I see Dylan's hand. I'm going to ask him to unmute. Hello. Well, I figure if if you got seven minutes open, that uh, you just just kind of looking to fill. I could certainly ask some some just more more questions about this. Okay. Um, because I'm just thinking, because right now, as I've mentioned before, we're working on over at the uh, the Board of Licensing Commissioners, we were really trying to think about private club regulations specifically relating to marijuana. Um, I know something had come up in Worcester, um, I think maybe about two years ago, where they were able to essentially open a marijuana private club, but they did so by opening up a cigar shop, more or less, a smoking bar, and they were able to essentially sell it by saying that you could smoke anything that was legally allowed to be consumed uh, inside the bar, uh, which is essentially how they became a recreational marijuana facility. So I'm just thinking as we go forward, where we're outlawing smoking bars entirely for tobacco, it really closes that route. Um, 
So over at um, BLC, we really want to really make the regulations specific to uh, marijuana. But I guess the real question, as, as I was kind of uh, mentioning before, you said that these regulations don't apply to marijuana yet, but they potentially could in the future. Because anything we want to do over at the uh, Board of Licensing Commission with that, we say it's okay, but then the Board of Health wants to say, no, we don't want uh, mar marijuana smoking inside, then that would you know, ultimately negate our ability to have those. So I guess what I'm, I'm asking is, is that even something really on, on your uh, radar at this point? Is it something as we kind of go down the line, the Board of Health will look at, has there really been any consideration on the part of the Board of Health for uh, recreational marijuana, uh, indoor use potentially? Hey, during a public hearing, we're not discussing anything. We can take that under advisement and we can discuss it at another uh, Board of Health meeting, but but that's not part of, of the hearing. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, then I just wanted to let you guys know what we're up to over there and uh, perfect, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, let's see, what time is it? We have three more minutes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> 517. I know I anticipated a lot of discussion and, and public comment with this. So that's why we had a the yeah. little bit of a long time for it. Well, there was an earlier email and I thought other people were gonna be joining, but they did not join. It's always best to be prepared, right? That's right. That is right. Okay. Just counting down two more minutes. So we, uh, so everything is legal. It's not bad to sit and take a moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can do some meditation. <laughs> I'm going to call it there. I just close. there's one hand raised. <clears throat> I just I just closed that participants. Okay, so Tamara. Tamara, you can Hi. speak. Um, so I guess if you have like a couple minutes to um kill, um, <laughs> I'm like joining. I'd like join this because um I go to UMass, so I'm like just taking a class where we're supposed to like attend like public hearings and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um. So I was just wondering, since I like missed like the first couple of minutes, like, um, like, I guess I was just wanting to know like what exactly like did I miss, I guess. <laughs> okay, there was a, I, I read a long statement opening about what public hearings were and what the Board of Health is. Um, and then that we just hear during a public hearing, we don't ask questions or speak per se, we can, mm -hmm it's not a discussion. Anybody else want to answer what what the public meeting was or at the beginning? Where did you come in? Um, like, do you mean like what time I came in at? Yeah. Um, like 5.06 or 5.07-ish. Uh, were we, were, was I reading off what the public health, what the Board of Health did in town? No. It was like, um, you're talking about like receiving an email about someone trying to get in. That was me, I think. <laughs> so the, you can even go on to the Amherst Board of Health and it, it just says that we, um, 
to see so I can tell you exactly that we, of course I've lost that sheet, that we create new regulations, review existing regulations, and we review and determine, do determinations on variance requests for existing uh, regulations, that this is one of three of our regulations. You can go onto our board uh, of health website and see our regulations and what Emma Dragon, who Emma Dragon is, and that um, at the close of the meeting, we'll accept testimony up until April 30th. I think T Tamara also is asking about, you know, this is a public hearing, but the public hearing is within a larger public meeting. So we're gonna, we have a lot of other things we're gonna to discuss tonight besides this one thing. So this is just the one thing is just a public hearing on a particular regulation, but then we're gonna do you know, like approving the minutes and hearing about COVID vaccinations, stuff like that af after this public hearing is over pretty much right now. Uh, okay. Am I allowed to still attend that or is that- sure. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely, okay. please do. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we we have met till five twenty. So I need a motion to close the public hearing. I move to close the public hearing regarding public smoking and vaping. Okay, may I have a second. Second. Okay, so now we need to vote. Steve. Aye. John. Aye. Maureen. Yes. Tim? Aye. And Nancy, aye. Okay, so the public hearing is closed and now we will go to our regular Board of Health meeting. And the first thing on the agenda is our minutes from our last meeting. And I had one question on that, Steve, for clarification. I'm paid to under new business, the Amherst Farmers Market, is it going to be moved to the South Amherst Common or the South portion of the downtown Amherst Common? I had that same question. <laughs> I thought it was the South portion of the Amherst Common, but okay. perhaps Ed might know as well. I think that's what they did in the spring, didn't they? Yeah, that's yeah. what they did last last year yeah or last year right ed you unmuted yourself do you have an answer okay for that? um i can't imagine that it's going to the south amherst common no right? but i that doesn't make sense to me so it's really the southern the southern portion of the downtown amherst common Yes, I believe that's correct. That makes sense. Okay. I good. did see something in the Gazette about work that's going to be done in the north part, and they just called it the North Common. You know, so I don't. <laughs> yeah. Or you can call it the South Downtown Common. I don't know. Central Common. Maybe. Common. South of whatever that street is. Is it Spring Street? Do you have a comment on that, Ed? <laughs> no. Okay. Any other comments on the minutes? Okay. Can I have a motion to approve them with that minor change? I move with the approved. We accept the minutes from March 11th meeting as uh, edited. Thank you, John. A second? I'll second. Okay. Maureen seconded. Okay, now we have to do the vote. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Okay, so we have that. Now, um, we have the tobacco handlers quiz and the fact sheet. So did everybody get the minutely revised fact sheet and the tobacco handlers quiz? Steve sent me a couple of corrections. Uh, one is on question seven on the quiz to say legal. 
uh, is it a, is it legal to sell a cigar? And the other one was I had an error on question the last one of the last questions. Question fourteen. I have both A and B, but I should change it to both of the above. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, there's no A and a B. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> I first started doing A, B, C, and then I took it out, so I didn't catch that. Does anyone have any questions on the quiz or comments? Um, I'm just reading this for the first time. This is kind of a, uh, actually, I mean, recently. It, I often make this point to students when they write such a sentence that measuring something does not ensure anything. So to, to like people will say, we test the water to ensure it's in compliance with the regulations. No, you test the water to, ev to have information to evaluate if, but it doesn't ensure anything and especially insure. I don't know what I mean, that's where, okay, where, where is where are you seeing that? Number 14, number 14. Oh, number 14. That we do conduct blank throughout the year to ensure retailers do not sell tobacco to members. I mean, there's no way those two checks can ensure that. Um, so I, I don't know what the right language is, but I always hate that kind of sentence because it does just doesn't cut it. <laughs> I don't know what the right wording is. Though. Um, uh, To assist retailers in not selling tobacco products to minors? Um, I would say agents of the Amherst Board of Health assess compliance with regulations by conducting blank throughout the year. Okay, would you just, would you just send <laughs> that, that to me, to John? People? What? Would you just send that to me? <laughs> I'll try. Because yeah. we already voted on this. On uh, last all right. Hey, it's not <laughs> a big deal. It's, it. not, it's not a big deal. I mean, I'm just saying it's a pet peeve of language use of mine. That, but I think most people, uh, you know. Just send me the correction. What? Just send me the correction. I'll put it in. Well, OK. All right. I don't want that in. Am, am I off the wall here? Or do anybody else agree with me? <laughs> that measuring things doesn't ensure anything. All it does is give you information to use to assess against some regulation or plan or whatever. The goal is, the goal is to ensure it, but the measurement doesn't do it. You're right. Mm -hmm. The process is in place to, to, uh, to you know, make, to help or check on compliance. But it's to help people be compliant and not get fined. Right. Not lose their ability to sell for three, seven or whatever days. Yeah. I'll try to send you emails through some more. Okay. So any other minor corrections on that? Then we have to find out how we get this to people and is it gonna be on the website? Remember, I think Steve had said, has something on the website for compliance, or do we do hand, or do these get hand delivered? I for the quizzes and everything. Yeah. I believe they were going to be. I, I'm not sure if they were going to be hand delivered by the PVTC staff or not. Um, what and that's that's that PVCT. That's the Pioneer Valley Com Combat. Yeah. Tobacco, so tobacco control, control. Mm -hmm. but this is our regulation so yep. we're saying it has to be done so we can't let it up to them yep we can assure that remember we had the uh, the talk with uh, with steve mccormick mm -hmm. from the um licensing commissioners mm -hmm. also and he said it was he was trying to put it on there to do it online but right. there's a problem because it could only be done once right that per <laughs> per person it's like a user thing. It's not meant, it's a build as, a, as the licensing and certification, not. Mm -hmm. to, or are we going to just skip that then and not try to do it online, maybe. Right, and do it on paper. Or try to do well, it on the fact sheet was supposed to help them pass it without yeah. on a one time, one time, one try, but 
I don't know that everybody will do that. So I mean, we have to figure out how we're going to get these out because it's in our regulation that we already passed. Yep. So I think for now that we should do paper and we should mail them to the establishments until um, Steve is able to assure that the technology piece is going to be corrected. I think that's a great lofty goal, but I think if right now we know paper is going to work, then we go with the old school of paper. We will mail them to the establishments uh, with the instructions and the resource. Great. So that'll bring us to the fact sheet. Does anybody have any comments on the fact sheet? I put the piece in that I omitted, Maureen, about the sale of flavored tobacco products or any enhanced tobacco product is pro prohibited in Amherst. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on that one? Okay, so that will be sent out with the tobacco products, I'll make the edit on the, on the quiz, and then they can go out to establishments. Great. Okay. Any further discussion on the tobacco handlers quiz and the fact sheet? Nope. Okay, with that, we'll move on to health inspectors, outdoor dining, farmer's market inspections, and any other issues going on. Is that you, Ed, or is that Emma? Yeah, I, I would love to lean to Ed for that. Um, I know that uh, there's been a few, um, one or two residential concerns um, for some mold that are tenants. Um, that has reached out to us as the health department. Um, I know that Susan Malone is working on food, uh, mobile food requests and farmer's market permits uh, and also for outdoor dining that's starting. You can see the great tables outside and the barriers and the planters that are starting to come out. Um, as well as I believe we've gotten our first couple dribs and drabs of camp requests for to hold camps, certainly within the current COVID-19 guidelines for day camps and also residential camps are starting to come in. Ed, do you have any other feedback that you have? Yeah, I could touch on a couple of things that you just mentioned. The um, uh, Amherst College is probably our largest provider of residential camps, especially. Um, and they've decided not to have the campus open for camps this summer. So some of those camps are making temporary plans, whether they you know, end up staying in these other locations that they find. Um, I know at least one contacted me and will be going to Mount Holyoke for the summer, um, but intend to come back to Amherst. So um, that'll be... Um, I've always thought it actually makes a fair bit of difference downtown for business. Mm -hmm. um, there are literally hundreds to, you know, at times quite a few hundreds of children who come in and out of town and it's sometimes their exposure. Amherst, there's a lot of international students that come um, to frankly to get something on their resume or their um, you know, they've been to Amherst College. They, you know, can write a more convincing letter, I guess, about why they really want to come. <laughs> um, at any rate, that's literally some of the things that the counselors and the um, administrators of some of the camps have said. So that won't be happening. Um, Susan's working with a number of other camps. I believe there'll be a couple based at Hampshire College this summer, as in the past. There's a farm camp that's long, long running there. That's a... Um, been a mainstay of our summer. Um, and sports camps, I'm not too up to date on those, but um, they may be 
the, the Commonwealth's regulations about those are complex. Um, let's see, and other things, the housing complaints we're getting, Emma mentioned a couple of mold complaints are more or less routine. Um, um, other than that, it's, it's started off to be a busy real estate season. Um, I see that in Title V work. Mm -hmm. um, and it's mostly in turnover of existing houses. Um, so it's, you know, the demand to come to Amherst and the price situation seems to be favorable. So other than that, I, I did submit the well results for uh, the water quality results. I don't know if we're coming to that or. Yeah, that okay. is, that's next on the agenda. Okay. Yep. The new business. So Emma, do you have anything else on any updates for the inspections? For health inspections, um, not really on my end, other than we continue to work together um, with the inspection services mm -hmm. department uh, and reach out and communicate together. Um, I'm really happy to have Ed and Susan as partners with that. And I'm just continue to learn more each day about how we work together. Good. So um, next under new business is the new well at 822 East Pleasant Street. Is that what you were talking about? It is. Ed, yeah. no? okay. Yes. Okay. So the um, homeowners are involved in this building project. Um, they were submitting their materials. They're hoping to be able to get a um, water supply certificate um, We'd like to be able to use the water starting later this month. Um, in the process of pulling together the information, it appears that their plumber had not submitted a complete application for the plumbing permit itself. So I don't have a number to go on the actual information about who's doing the connection. Um, but the, 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 we know the plumber. He hasn't submitted his, I think his um, workers comp information and some other more or less details, um, and we're, that's in the works. So if you wanna make a decision pending receipt of a completed permit application from the plumber, I think that would be appropriate. Ed, Ed I have a question. Um, do yes. we not have a water supply certificate form? We don't, um, we, so far as I know, we never have, but uh, Stephen yeah. McCarthy is working on one. I so, mean, we, we required in the regulation a water supply certificate separate from the permit. Yes. But here we have a group of things that are being submitted, but there's no, it's weird that we don't have a document that says water supply certificate. Stephen and I were working on that to satis satisfy this request. So we will have I, one. I remember us talking about it and me feeling like I wanted to contribute to that before I was done on the board, So, which is going to be soon. So. Um, it would be nice to get that done because, yeah, it's... within a week we'll be we'll be oh, there. You're going to have a something to fill out. Okay, yeah. is that where the plumber thing would come up? Um, there's an application which I think actually I did not submit with the material to Emma for this meeting because it was incomplete. Um, What's it called? Application. For... It's an application for the water supply certificate. Um, oh, we do have a form. I'm, I'm confused. We have a form. We don't have a certificate per se of that. Oh, no, 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 no. But we have a, so we do have a form to yes. apply for a water supply certificate. That's what I was looking for because that's what yeah. I thought we were being asked to review. Yep. Um, okay. But it's not complete, you said, because it's, it's. No, unfortunately. Okay. We have an application form. That's why I was looking around, looking, oh, no, that's the construction permit. That's not the. Uh, And the property is actually 846A East Pleasant Street, not 822? No, I believe that's actually 822. It's behind 846. Um, well, the construction permit says 846. Right. And, and since then, the, the lot was renumbered. So the, the actual number, this is very recent, is 822. Okay. But it's that same, it's that location where- uh, it, it is, it's the same parcel. 
What remind us of the reason why folks want to get a well when they're adjacent to a public water system? Uh, in this case, I believe the water supply line is on the far side of East Pleasant Street. Oh. And the um, DPW was going to require them to resurface a section of road because it had been, I think the town had redone it recently enough yeah. that this was a, rather than have a, a cut and patch yeah. through fairly recent um, roadway wow. improvement, they were going to have to restore it to that level. And the, the cost just was, was more than drilling 600 feet in the bedrock. Wow. Uh, and this apparently. is the one that's far out and it's behind that colonial, correct? Yes, that's it, right. It's the new, it's the new construction. Yes. It's, yes. Yeah. Right. I remember all this discussion the last time. Yeah. Um, about why they were not, why they were drilling and not connecting. Mm, yeah, that was it. Thank you for the reminder. Yeah. It's certainly entitled to, I'm just curious. Um, yeah, we, we have, I'm, lo I'm looking, I'm sorry, I didn't forward the partially completed water supply certificate, but the plumber performing of the connection um, is Harvey Rivard of Yankee Ingenuity. He's based in Montague. Uh, the electrical connections were done by AGE Electric. Um, and the request was filed by Linda Rauch, who's one of the two owners of the property. Okay. So I noticed that there's a test from, water quality test from July of 20. Um, a very uh, July 15th was the date the sample was collected. So after the well was developed. And then there's a set of separate iron and uh, uh, manganese um, measurements and bacteria analysis that were conducted a month later. I, and yeah, I think that's it, right? On quality. And then right. there's a report on it. Uh, on the well, it's the DEP report on um, well completion. So. so from, a, I guess, uh, uh, looking at our regs, is there's a water supply requirement, which this seems to meet. It has lots of water. Um, and do you have any comments on the water quality stuff yourself, Ed? Um. The problems with iron and manganese are fairly common and yeah. can be dealt with by a filtering system. Yep. Are they putting a, like a whole whole house filter in there? That's what I would expect. Yeah, the manganese is challenging at a home level. I happen to be, manganese is one of my things, but uh, <laughs> in terms of expertise and treatment. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's challenging. It's too bad, but it's common. <laughs> um, that perhaps would have been an advantage of town water. But. Yeah. I mean, we do take manganese out of Baby Carrot Brook, well, number four, <laughs> as more manganese than this, and we take it out. But, uh -huh. uh, but, uh, but, but we, yeah, the, the public water supply doesn't have iron or manganese issues, correct. Interesting. Um, so, and their bacteria, they had a positive total coliform the first time, but they have net absent on the second ones, which makes sense. And the first test they had was very comprehensive. I mean, much more than you'd be required to do, many people would do. What well, those NAs mean? Non, does it mean they didn't do the test? And if so, why did they report the NA result? Um, no, it's not a result. It's a, a, so the results, the NAs are under acceptable level. And it just means that there isn't a, uh, a, ma a maximum contaminant level or a, uh, a regulation for that specific thing in the way that they've, they've written it. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm a little surprised at some of them. The sodium, there are also secondary limits about, but I guess it's, 
So, I mean, just to get nitpicky, there's something there called bromotichloromethane. That's one of the trihalomethanes. We have a regulation about the sum of four compounds, but not each individual one. Um, I don't know if they have that listed this way. Um, yeah, it's secondary under test type means that it's aesthetic, not health-based. Um, and primary means it's health-based. Uh, and some of the standards are not as straightforward as written here. So um, I guess that's what they mean by not NA in these. Um, just trying to look through. It's all pretty much not there, which is good. Um, yeah, so they'll have their challenge with uh, iron, with manganese mostly. But. So what's our task here, Nancy or Emma? I don't know. Uh, That's what I'm at. So yeah. what do you want, Ed? <laughs> New uh, would like the approval of the board that they have created a, um, a water supply that they can use for their new home. Um, you know, so it can become a potable water source for them. So they want us to approve a water supply certificate. Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and what else is on that form? Is there anything? I mean, these are, it's the water supply. I'm reading the regs. Yeah. The only thing that is lacking is literally the permit number. Um, permit for the plumbing? The plumber, yes. The plumber's permit. Oh, okay. Um, and you're okay with that? Well, I, I, I won't release the water supply certificate to the homeowners right. until the plumber finishes his um, his job his job here. So we'll need a motion to accept the uh, water certification as long when the plumber's permit number is submitted to you. Is that yeah. what we need then, Ed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you'll approve the water supply, I will hold that until the plumber's permit is okay. complete. Would someone make that motion, please? Or get, can I make the motion as chair? Okay. So I move that we approve the water supply cert, uh, certificate, provided the plumber submits his permit number to Ed. Does that sound correct? May I have a second? Second. <laughs> Okay, so all in favor, John. Aye. Tim. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Steve. Aye. Nancy, aye. Okay, you've got it, Ed. All right, thank you. Okay, so anything else you need, Ed? I, th I think I'm all set. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. So now we're moving on to the director's report. Well, you got the item in there before that. that says oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, I missed that one. I double missed it. The Board of Health member appointments. So Angela sent me an email that Maureen, Tim, and John are up for whether they want to continue or be replaced. And Maureen and Tim said yes. Did Angela send you any more information to either of you? No. Okay, so she will be sending it to you because it's June. And John has extended himself for this year and he I gotta be done. <laughs> is moving on. <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, seven years is, is what I, that is enough. <laughs> is moving uh, on. Do so, some other things and I, I wish I, I'm, Scratch my head and I continue to try to find a, a sort of water quality engineer type person to replace me. I don't have an idea right now, but I, I think we should all think about that. But I don't have someone in mind. Uh, we have a long, I'm in the third faculty member in a row to serve on this from CU. Right, it was, it was Dave before you. Right? Uh, David Offeld then, uh, well, first it was Serena Ergus, then David Offeld, then me in succession for about 20 years here, so. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, and I don't yeah. think David wants to come back. No, I, I kind of scratched, talked to him about that a little bit. Um, 
one person that comes to mind, he's on, he's on the Water Supply Protection Committee and is Jack Jemsick. He's, he worked for, uh, worked for uh, New England Environmental and then he worked, he might be, uh, he's either retired or on his own, but he's been on the Water Supply Protection Committee. Oh, okay, yeah. And he does wetlands and water stuff. I mean, I don't know if Jack would, would be interested in Borley Health or, or not. And then do you, do you think Marco would, is Marco still in town? Do you think he would like to come back? I think he's still in town. I, you can ask him, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I don't think so, but uh, yeah, but I don't know that. So in the past, Emma, Julie has reached out to people, sure, and asked them. So we have Jack Jemsick. Yeah, my son-in-law also knows him, and Marco Briscotta, who had been on the board in the past. I don't Possibly. know if he'd want to come back. Tim, do you have any ideas? Well, uh, I was thinking about more junior faculty in civil engineering. You know, I don't know if anyone. I ha I know that many of the <laughs> yeah, his John is lauding his head. Well, <laughs> maybe we should reach out should to them do. without John knowing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so the one person who would love it would be right in her wheelhouse. Um, I mean, I have one, two. Three, four, uh, uh, untenured junior faculty who are living in Amherst in this field, but I don't want them to do that now. <laughs> they shouldn't do that now. Um, Emily Kumpel is in her fourth year. Um, this is what she does, water and public health. That's what she does. Um, she would be excellent, but she's got a, you know, a one and a half year old kid in his pre-tenure and <laughs> Uh, it's just not not the right thing, I think. To so, I mean, I'm I'm happy to talk to her about it, but it's not. It's I'd be uh, disingenuous if I was bringing it up to her about what I thought she should do. Um, another person is working. His wife works at Amherst College. Christian Guzman is is living in town right at the moment, but he's brand he's newer than Emily. He really shouldn't do this. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, it, it's just not someone that I that I know. Um, there's another faculty member who does water, not so much water quality, and is going to be tenured next year. But um, I don't think he he's the right person. He's trying to get some land in outside of Amherst anyway right now. Um, but I wish I had the right person. Tim, who are you thinking of? Probably Emily, right? Or oh, uh, I was thinking of Christian. Christian, yeah, I mean, he's also the right kind of person. Yeah, you're right, Tim. I mean, he is, but- yeah. And what's his last name? Guzman, G-U-Z-M-A-N. That's, that's what I was gonna say too, Nancy. And what's his name? Christian <laughs> Guzman. Now, I have a neighbor what? who's in public health and her dissertation was on water in, I believe, Africa. It's Gretchen Peltier, but she doesn't have the engineering background that John has. Yeah, yeah, Gretchen. She Do you know her at all? I don't know. She married to Steve Peltier. Right? No, she's married to Rick Peltier, who's faculty. Excuse me, Rick. I meant the yeah, wrong. Yeah. I said the wrong name. Rick. Yes. Yeah, Rick. She's Air married Qual to Rick Peltier. Yeah, yeah. Air, uh, Rick's a uh, air air quality air, guy. Yeah, public, air and masks and all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rick's in public health. Um, she is. She's home with three children, and she's not working right now. Yeah. because she's being home with three children. Yeah. But she might enjoy the, the challenge of, of public health because that's yeah. what a PhD is in. Yeah, I mean, that sounds reasonable if you wanna and ask someone. You don't, like you said, there's the engineering side, but uh, there's one I, person, I, well- in I'll, call, I'll call Gretchen, uh, Emma, because- I, she lives next door and I see her regularly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll reach out to the other two. I will say, um, John, I know that you've been talking about individuals who have children and families and stuff like that. And, and, and I totally appreciate that perspective. But I know that for myself, when um, I started my, my term on the Hadley Board of Health, I was um, still yet to deliver. Uh, I know. Yeah. So. <laughs> 
worried yeah. about tenure. <laughs> I'm worried about tenure of these uh, assistant professors have invested an immense amount of money in. How about that? To get okay. to get to get, um, to get pretty to the point. Um, that's yeah. part of part of what I'm not I, but the university, whatever. Anyway, stretching people too thin. But Got it. people need to do what they want to do. I mean, yeah. I do that, but my job is to mentor them appropriately to take on tasks. But there are service roles and professional roles, so um, it's not out of the, the the question by by any means. So maybe we should ask Emily and let her decide. I, listen, don't if if you don't mind. I if let me before you reach out to either Emily or Christian, I need to do that first. Okay. So all right. So you will do that. I will do that. Okay. And and I'll reach out to Jack Jemsek and Marco Riscata. No. Marco is. Boskardin, B-O-S-C-A-R-D-I-N. Got it. So John is, is uh, Rick Palmer. He, he's a geotechnical engineer. Is Rick Palmer in Amherst? Not for long. <laughs> oh. No, he's moving to Seattle uh, he's moving imminently. imminently this summer. Yeah. Moving out of the house by the end of this month, as a matter of fact, and sold their house. So uh, his wife is actively trying to find a find their next place in Seattle. But uh, the bidding wars there are crazy. Any other Maybe. ideas, Tim? Uh, how about Chul Park? He's a full professor, right? Yeah, um, I that. Possible. He's he's very involved in a Korean language school. He actually was head of a, a Korean Amer uh, language school. Uh, um, I don't know if he'd want to do it. I I could ask him. I could ask what he what he think. Yeah, chosen town. Um, okay, you'll ask he, him, John. He's a wastewater engineer. He's pretty quiet. That'd be very helpful. Uh, sort of person, but he's a wastewater engineer. I don't know if he wants to do it. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll find out if, if those the the faculty are interested in that. Uh, there's one civil engineer I might ask. It doesn't have anything to do with water or health, but his engineer. Okay. So, and your term ends June. 31st, 30th. I think there isn't a 31st. There isn't there a 31st. Is a 30th. June 30th. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> June 30th. That's like saying it never ends on you know, June 31st. <laughs> June 30th. If only June we get to June 31st, one of these years. I have a question. Has everybody on the board been immunized? Have you been immunized, Tim? No. Okay. Because I thought, oh, maybe we could start meeting in person if everybody gets immunized. I don't know what the town's philosophy is going to be on that, but. Yeah, I, I know that in terms of the town, we're still in discussions about um, how to move forward because um, it is challenging uh, having meetings. We're not sure if it's going to be like a dual method because certainly some people yes. still really enjoy the Zoom and the accessibility of it. Um, participation has has increased since being able to use Zoom as a method. So, but there's mm -hmm. lots of tech challenges with that that I know are trying to be worked out in the background. So more to come. Been fully on Zoom for a year now. <laughs> The uh, questions of returning to the workplace are really fascinating and starting to mount to me. <laughs> so interesting in many ways. I heard UMass is coming back full force in September. That's what the website says. Yep. <laughs> okay, any other comments on Board of Health member appointments? Okay, so we can move on to the director's report. All right, so. Um, wow, six o'clock on the agenda, six o'clock on the clock. And Nancy, whoa. wow, what a, what that's a predictor. A, that's a good <laughs> meeting. Um, so in the last week, the trends for 
COVID cases in Amherst, um, we had a total of 23, which was lower than last week, 20 of which were associated with UMass, and three of them were town of Amherst residents, um, a mix of on and off campus, mostly off campus. And um, the ages were really um, spread out as the majority, the condensed amount really be, being between the ages of 18 and 21. And then the genders being pretty even between male, female, and non-binary. Uh, there was one transgender individual. Um, so there was one daycare exposure. Um, I know there was one with a camp that we've done, uh, but there doesn't has not been any transmission observed at either one of those places, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Arlene Reed, our contact tracing nurse support, who's working remotely, who's fantastic and really on the money. Um, in we're really excited to be able to use her as well as the contact tracing collaborative to continue our relationships with UMass and Amherst College and all of their robust uh, contact tracing programs. In terms of uh, COVID vaccine in Massachusetts, um, to date, uh, there has been over 4 million cumulative doses of vaccine distributed uh, and over 1.5 in million individuals in Massachusetts that are fully vaccinated. Uh, and then when we speak about Hampshire County, when we get down to the weekly reports of how everything's distributed, only uh, with Hampshire County, there has been 40% um, of our pop of doses shipped to the county by population, which is the lowest and disproportionate to other areas in the state. That's but consistent when, <laughs> week when, to week. <laughs> yeah, but actually, but it's interesting because then when you look down farther in the report, the cumulative percentage of individuals with at least one dose of vaccine is 36%, which is in line for that. So mm -hmm. that to me shows that people are going outside of Hampshire County to access the vaccine. Yep. And then oh, yeah. there's a cumulative percentage of uh, individuals who are fully vaccinated is 21%, which is on the lower side of the scale of the span, but still within expected amounts. Um, and then when we look in terms of how we've been doing with vaccine at our local site, uh, the two regional sites together have administered over 65,000 doses of vaccine so far. Um, with the UMass as well. And then for us in Amherst, we've done just about 7,000 leading into this week. Uh, we've also administered over 200 home vaccines with the homebound program, fully vaccinating 140 individuals so far. Uh, we're scheduled to go out with our crews again tomorrow with that robust program uh, with a mix of EMTs and uh, the paramedics and some hired uh, per diem nurses for that. Yep. Can I ask a question about that? Sure. Um, any, any luck or chance they could get the Johnson vaccine so it's one and done? Yeah, that's a great question, John. So that's actually what we're doing moving forward. The state is allocating Johnson & Johnson specifically to homebound programs. Hey, uh, it comes good. out of a different allocation. So we don't have to um, change the amount that we're giving here at our clinics, which is great. Uh, yeah. The homebound clinic of, uh, program, we are covering all 20 uh towns in Hampshire County, as well as Sunderland, Franklin County, which is right next door. Um, and we're really excited about that. So well, that's the only thing that makes sense is to get the one if you can. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. Wonderful. Yeah, for sure. Um, other things that we've been doing, uh, talking about the camps and reopening, which I know we already discussed with inspection services, and just really trying to think about beyond COVID. Um, with what will, not the new normal, but um, as COVID kind of progresses, what can we recenter on? Uh, I know Nancy and I have, have spoke a little bit about community health needs assessments um, and really trying to do a thorough community assessment to really get a pulse in terms of 
where we can improve our efforts and really make a strong impact. And I know I really look forward for us to be able to do that. Um, here in our department, uh, we are onboarding additional admin support being funded under the CARES funding, which is gonna be wonderful to help us to keep up with phone calls, um, emails, uh, paperwork that needs to be done in response to clinics and vaccine efforts, and, and also just the overall reaching COVID-19 response right now, as well as the homebound program. Uh, we have done a lot of focused work on equity that is remains a, a pillar of the yeah recommend the brain fart lost it ah! uh, but equity remains a, a, a point of, that we really want to try and meet and keep a regular focus on uh, we have been communicating and working with the john musanti health center to help address their patients that need improved access to the vaccine with their challenging hours of work there. Um, we've been communicating with and working with the bid in the chamber to access restaurant workers and other essential workers in town, uh, as with regularly working with Craig's Doors for their guests and employees as well. Um, we have had um, some communication with uh, community outreach to do to down in South Amherst at South Point Apartments in the Boulders. Um, we've been communicating and, and collaborating with the Cooley Dickinson Hospital who just recently this past weekend, I believe, had their uh, van out at the Boulders to try and do some education, bilingual education about vaccines to improve um, adhere, like people accessing it to reduce that vaccine hesitancy. One of the things that I know that um, we just got kind of hot off the press this morning um, is an increased awareness now that the Johnson & Johnson is becoming more of a widely distributed vaccine, the adverse reactions possible for that. Um, in Northampton at their clinic yesterday, they did, um, I believe over 500 vaccines and they did have quite a few uh, alert adverse reactions for that. So that's just something that we're keeping on our radar. Uh, with what our, were the adverse reactions and what have we been having? So we have not had any severe allergic reactions. Well, I've seen several people go off in the ambulance. So what happened to them? Yep. So some people may have had like a, a slight allergic reaction, meaning a little bit of a rash mm -hmm. um, where they had to be monitored, but no one's had to be admitted. Um, How many people have we had with that? I believe four so far over our whole 7,000 in our clinic. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. um, that's a well, great Now point. you can go on to what happened. So Northampton's doing Johnson and Johnson. Yep. So we're okay. all doing a mix of Johnson and Johnson. Um, and, and in Northampton, it's Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer with us, we're doing all three vaccines. So yesterday um, there, they had, they said, uh, Meredith reported about 10 adverse reactions, oh. um, which one of them was uh, a cardio event, but we, they didn't know if that was related to the vaccine or just um, happened to happen around the same time. Um, and that person was transferred for to the hospital. There was also an article about a Colorado vaccine site um, that had to close early recently um, in response to the Johnson & Johnson. Uh, at our vaccine clinics here with Johnson & Johnson so far, we've had two Johnson & Johnson clinics, which were fairly small uh, and did not have any severe allergic reaction where we had to transport anybody. Um, I think one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is that we do have our paramedics and fire department that we work with here. Uh, we have uh, emergency equipment ready to go. Um, and in the event that for some reason there wouldn't be a paramedic here, we still have emergency response equipment of that EpiPen on site to administer right away. Emma, um, in terms of uh, allergic you know, severe allergic responses coming out of the clinical trials, 
Was there an expectation of diff what what was ex what was different between the three vaccines with respect to that? Were you, yeah. Was this expected from the clinical trials for Johnson & Johnson or is this newly developing? I, I believe this is newly developing. Um, I think we learn more each day. I know also, I mean, in terms of COVID long haulers with the younger population, we're, we're realizing that there's more strokes um, and chronic depression and mood disorder. <laughs> and anxieties, um, which I think a lot of these things are, are challenging when we're doing such quick clinical trials to observe. Yeah. yeah. Nancy, John, I know John, you do a lot of two, great reading. Two and a half weeks ago, I was on a webinar with the Johnson & Johnson, which they don't call Johnson & Johnson, they call it Janssen. Janssen. It's, Janssen. Janssen. Well, it's, it's Janssen. Janssen. It's, a Danish, Janssen. it's a Danish word, Janssen. Janssen. Yeah. And um, they were, saying that the allergic reactions, this was two and a half weeks ago, were very similar to the reactions and the side effects that Pfizer and Moderna. So that was two and a half weeks ago. And of course, it was people from Johnson & Johnson, although it was put out by the CDC, it, the, it was, they were the ones speaking. Yeah, um, yeah. On the other hand, I, I read information that it's been a follow-up to the Moderna and Pfizer and the incidence of uh, anaphylaxis, I think, was around three per million doses in one and about a little less than five per million doses in the other. So it seems to be concern, you know, there, but, you know, quite rare. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know what Janssen will be uh, and, and once the it's out there in the real world. Yeah. I also anecdotally heard it's more painful and that people are maybe more fainting. I, I don't know huh. if that's the case or not. That, Again, that's, that would be a good um, thing to- I don't know if the for. needles are different and it's more painful or if the shot hurts more itself or- Yeah, the Johnson & Johnson, it uh, the volume is 0.5 mLs and the equipment that we get for it is the same as the Moderna for the uh -huh. supplies. So, yeah. so it's not the tuberculin syringe like the Pfizer. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there are all of these yeah. intricacies that we don't really know about. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I will say for us, our, our Jen Brown was following our allergic reactions, Nancy, mm -hmm. um, and when we first opened and we were having around that 1.8% Okay. But that after the first two weeks, it it we've really have not seen any substantial path for that continued path. Yeah, and the other thing that was mainly on the webinar was the the five dose vials and the longer uh, shelf life once you defrost it. That was and that that's really good because if you go out and make five visits, there's five and you have a seven, I think it was six or seven hours. I, I, I can't remember which it was to use it. So yep. it's great for homebound. Is... Yep. Uh, and it also said with, with that vaccine, as with the other vaccines, the older you are, the fewer side effects they were seeing and the younger you are, the more um, <clears throat> you were seeing. Yeah, the Johnson & Johnson can keep, um, after it's drawn up, if it's kept refrigerated in transport, which we bought these great, they're traditionally used for insulin, but um, we did buy those for our, our mobile um, homebound bags and equipment, uh, ref, uh, ice packs uh, and holders for our vaccines so they can be safely stored and carried and transported. Um, the Johnson and Johnson for two hours at room temperature is good, and then six hours when it's cooled. Right. So that's great. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I have another question that you might not be able to answer. What is the town doing with the since March fourteenth? Forty dollars per injection. Before that, it was a different formula of twenty-eight for the first and twenty-seven for the second. I can't remember. But after March fifteenth, the town can get under Medicare and um, the free care. It varies by other insurance companies. That's a lot of money coming in. Yeah, that's a great question, Nancy. So I know that. 
Um, I spoke with Sean Mangano, the finance director, about that several times, wondering um, and, and <laughs> hoping that we'll be able to access that because um, certainly that it's a, a major pull by our health department and our board of health here with our mission. Uh, there are lots of questions still with the funds in terms of what bucket um, they'll be able to go in, whether it would be a general fund or a revolving fund. Uh, I know Sean is um, actively looking out to get those answers, but since this is a new system, um, I think there's still a lot of questions to be answered with that before we can give clear answers. In terms exactly. of a lot of costs in this process too, right. with, the, mm -hmm. with the firefighters yeah. and you know other uh, town employees who are involved in providing you know working at these clinics. I mean there are volunteers, but there are also a number of paid positions that are required. So it's not cheap is, to do it. <laughs> is that money you're talking about, Nancy, or and, and Emma? Is that CARES Act money coming? Or no, so. Sorry to interrupt, John. I'm just so excited. Uh, <laughs> I normally don't like talking about money because it's not something in health that I normally get to be on the receiving side of, right? <laughs> um, I just think about my co-pays and all of that stuff. Um, so this, uh, the town of Amherst and, and vaccine distribution and administration, um, Boards of Health and, and other health departments can uh, enroll with Commonwealth Medicine, which is our uh, out of UMass Med Medical Center to help be our payer um, processor for that. Um, before I came on, we were not enrolled with Medicare, Mass Health, or any private um, insurers. Uh, we were only able to vaccinate underinsured or uninsured individuals on a limited basis, um, which was what Jen Brown was doing. Okay. Um, the last person that had um, been able to fin work this out was Epi Bodhi uh, mm -hmm. when I was doing my research when I came. So that's really who I got to build off of to get us re-enrolled for these programs um, to at least be able to get us the capability, Nancy, to receive these funds. Yeah, once the, once the health department got rid of the school nurses and the home care unit, that's when they lost the ability to um, uh, bill. And they, there's a new ICD, I always want to say nine, but it's now ICD-10. Yeah. yeah. People know what ICD numbers are. They're, they're the numbers yes. that you <laughs> bill. Oh yeah, Maureen, you know. And that's how, how everything in, in healthcare gets paid if you have the right code. Right. Um, and so there is a special code or maybe, I think maybe two now for COVID, COVID vaccine things. Great, well, that's great. And then I just have a, another question. I've been referring a lot of people come uh, and they're usually Chinese or Southeast Asian workers. Uh, today, there was someone from um, Whole Foods who came who wanted to get an appointment. And I know Jennifer Reynolds has been helping people. Are you working with Jennifer? Because she's been doing a lot of outreach yep. to get... Uh, yeah. Non-white so, people. Yes, absolutely. So that I forgot to highlight Jen Brown. Um, but with Jen our, Reynolds. But, uh, Jen Reynolds, sorry. But with, I was actually just communicating with her early this morning. Um, we were able to get over 50 individuals of the, the population similar to what you're speaking about um, mm -hmm. appointments this week into okay. our clinics but with working with Jen. Because for about two or three weeks, I, I, I ran out of her cards. I would be handing out her cards to people so that they could call her. So um, is she officially employed by the senior center or? Yes. But she's yes. doing more a broad approach. I know she's good at that. And I knew I was sending seniors in her direction. Yeah. But she's really been, anyone. The, she's really been a champion um, with that, with the outreach. Um, 
I, I also want to applaud Helen McMillan and mm -hmm. um, Mary Beth's team with all the outreach that they've been doing for the seniors. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just countless hours. I know Helen McMillan um, with several patients that have spe the specific um, like case management needs, um, some behavioral health supports has actually gone out uh, when our paramedics have been vaccinating people to give them that extra sense of oh. comfort and support. Um, I, I just really, it's been an amazing to see everybody come together for these efforts. Yeah, because uh, yeah, because I've been, you know, reaching out to them, and they've been w wonderful with um, uh, workers. Yeah, we have Miss Saigon would not uh, release. She had gotten appointments for Miss Saigon people at all different points, and Miss Saigon wouldn't let them off work to get their vaccines, and she got them their appointments at CVS. Yep, and. And most of them are expected, certainly I can't speak on individual cases, right, because of HIPAA and privacy concerns, but a, a, a large majority of the population you're concerned about, Nancy, will be at our clinic this week. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. We're really working hard at the equity piece. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know for myself, I, I don't think I'll ever feel like I'm doing enough <laughs> in that way, right? Um, but I'm just really proud of the work that we are doing. Now, can you explain the CARES Act money? What, what is that? How is it coming to you and how is it being used? Can you give us just an overall view of that? Sure. So there's a couple different ways that it's coming. So we have gotten some health department, meaning local health specific funds that have been channeled to us from the Piner Valley Planning Commission. Um, and those funds went to them as the distributor for Western Massachusetts from the Department of Public Health. Um, we used a lot of those funds for testing this fall, this winter for the COVID testing when we did the mobile clinics um, to purchase our, our great new uh, refrigerator and freezer, um, the vaccine carriers that we have. That's how we've been able to fund um, these temporary positions to help us with the COVID vaccines, uh, the administrative support and the additional hours that the town staff has had to perform, including um, the paramedics. Uh, there's also the kind of greater town overflow of CARES money, which comes out of a different bucket, if you will, um, which I know a lot of the, the fire department staff for overtime that's coming out of. Um, so that's kind of the two ways that it comes to us. Now, do the ambassadors, are they funded through CARES money? I believe they were previously funded through CARES money. And I know... Um, I, I think it will continue to be CARES money. However, there was a $50,000 earmark uh, that Senator Joe Comerford and Mindy Dome worked really, really hard to be able to have happen. So that way the COVID ambassadors can continue to be funded this year. Now on the temporary, so that's like Michelle, I don't yep. know who else. How long do you have them to work with you? How temporary, is it two months, three months? Yeah. Or? So with temporary positions, it's an estimate of between three and six months. We have to anticipate that we're not going to use them beyond six months. Mm -hmm. um, however, that is always subject to change. I think one of the things that we're learning about COVID is what we know today and think might happen tomorrow might not be the case, right? Mm -hmm. I know a lot of times we're able to kind of plan for end dates in the future. Um, but with COVID, who knows where we're going to be next year? Are we going to be opening clinics back up to do boosters of vaccine. I just kind of like the flu vaccine after these strains come out. So I think lots of unknowns. Um, Michelle's position is a, a temporary position as are the uh, additional admin support that are, are, the goal is for them to start um, next week or so. Okay, so it's beyond Nancy Schroeder. Correct. Right? We have a new hire that starts on Monday, whose name is Tobiah. And then the second part-time position we have not uh, officially hired a candidate for. And, and, and Tobiah will help you with? 
What was she? Is it she or he? It's a he. Okay. Um, yep. Uh, he, him, his pronouns. And uh, he's going to be able to help with um, phone support. Uh, we, we've been having the assistance of Marion Jordan from the recreation department for about a two month period, um, who's having to be pulled back to the rec department because spring is here and, and summer is coming. Um, so Tobias really to kind of fold into the duties that Marion was doing with the health department email, monitoring our phone throughout the day um, and helping book appointments if people have questions in the homebound program. Thank you. Yeah. And the other position will be similar to that? It'll be similar to that. We really find that during the day, mostly mornings and after midday, there's lots of phone calls, mm -hmm. lots of double stacked phone calls. Um, so we think that having two people available for that would be great. And then with the kind of ramping up of that homebound program with the Johnson and Johnson coming on board, that second person will really be able to do the help assist with the coordination of the homebound program yeah. specifically. Are you working with the senior center on this? Cause I know they get a lot of calls too. Cause I tell people to call the senior center. Yeah, we work, um, regularly with them. I communicate with Helen and Jen Reynolds. We have that online form for people to enroll for. We also take phone calls and enroll people that way. Um, I'm also communicating quite frequently with the senior centers uh, around us, um, just with lots of inquiries. So it's been a really great opportunity to build relationships with those other towns. Um, and, and they just really can't thank us enough for, for helping yeah. out with the homebound program. Thank you. With as you mentioned, people going back to their real jobs. I was thinking about the school nurses going back to their real jobs, and how how is that working, and who's come coming in to fill some of those spots? Yeah, uh, yeah. So the school nurses are um, kind of stepping back a little bit and refocusing, reframing on the schools. Certainly, Mary um, and and. Robin continued to be uh, very helpful to us. Um, I, I believe, uh, I mean, this is really up to Michelle uh, as being our vaccine coordinator, mm -hmm. but I think that we're at that moment where we're gonna reopen volunteer and recruitment again. Mm -hmm. um, I know that when I spoke with Lauren Davin the other day, uh, Hampshire County now has over 1,500 vetted MRC volunteers, which is just incredible, wow. it's a really robust group. So um, when we had really reached saturation with our volunteer group, I'd say about a month and a half ago, maybe right after we started at the high school, um, we kind of put a pause on recruiting more volunteers. But I'm, I am sensing that we're kind of at that point again where we might want to re-engage people. So I, I know, um, are, are both of them at, uh, is, I know Robin's at the high school. Where is Mary? Because the high school isn't opening per se any time that they know. Where, where is Mary? Mary's at the high school as well. Okay. I know that um, Robin is the interim manager for the school nurses. So really likes to be able to be a resource for the other school nurses. Um, they are assisting with the pool testing that's a, a occurring at the different schools. And I think some other okay. um, manners that I think we, I just don't initially think of because um, it's very easy for me to kind of go to that too, Nancy. And then I just think about how much I'm, I can imagine that they, they are fielding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody uh, else have any questions? Yeah, I had um, one question. I was just curious if you can tell this from the data. I think uh, overall for the country and, and, and everything, we're, we're thinking oh, what level of vaccination can we get to? And, and I'm wondering what you're seeing with age group wise. Like if we just take this, the first group that was in 75 plus or take the 65 to 75, from a percent of our residents, the, there's this weekly report, but are we plateauing um, in terms of no more 75 plus coming in, no more 65 plus coming in. Where are we, where are we getting, and what's that plateau and is it Yeah, 
So I love that. So I was looking at the reports earlier and then I closed them because I was yeah. like, I'm done. Yeah. I won't yeah. need them anymore. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. so silly? Um, but when I open- What's your sense of it? I mean, So I, feel, I know Hampshire County are 70 to 74 population, I believe. Um, it, we have like the highest percentage in all of the state, which I am just really love. Um, and- I remember seeing some numbers at the statewide of the oldest group in the order of 80 or 75 or 80% with at least one dose. So that yep. means that, that many are gonna get vaccinated at least. Yeah, so in Hampshire County, we're over 80%. I do remember that, which is why I was like, woo, we're like a really high number. Um, I, I do wish that uh, the state had some plan, if you wanna um, phrase, phrase it that way with, with college age students before they would disperse back home. Um, but I but I don't get the sense um, that there is one. A special uh, plan, no. Yeah. No. Yeah, I was speaking with someone today who was working at Smith and they yeah. said that the, you know, at, at the health center level, but she was saying the presidents and the administrative staffs of the colleges were trying to band together and try to help make something happen but it wasn't clear that anything was going to happen yeah i was on a five college consortium meeting i last week or the week i think it was last week on friday to, on this very topic and and all of the college health departments are and emergency preparedness are ready to go um and eager and and understand the captive audience that they have uh, but there does not seem to be a plan. I mean, if you're, you could be dosing vaccines after your nasal swab at the Mullen Center, man, you yeah. just roll them through. And <laughs> but, they, have, yeah. they have the student nurses there for a few more weeks. Yes, yep. we do. Um, I know Northeastern is going to be requiring immunization for students to return. I think but, a lot of colleges probably will. It's a hot topic. I mean, my understanding in the state of Massachusetts is that that's a governor level decision, not a individual institution, but I could be wrong on that. Um, I, the topic's there. I, it's being asked by all of us and being asked mm -hmm. by- There me. are a, a large number of vaccinations that are required for college students. Exactly. It just exactly. seem like, why not have these yeah. as well? Yeah. Makes sense to me, but it doesn't yeah. seem like we're there yet. And obviously nobody wants to require something that in the end, you can't do, right? So mm -hmm. everybody's hedging on it. I mean, that assumes the supply and the distribution or whatever works out, but. So Emma, would you say then we're, we're still supply limited in terms of shots in the arm? Yeah, so we are, we are supply limited. Um, we are still not at our total capacity of what we can do as with the Hampshire County site. Yeah. Um, yeah. We can, the state continues to approve and announced that other additional uh, regional collaboratives are, are opening like the Big E um, and Chicopee, but I believe they're not open yet. They haven't had secured supply at this time. Um, so- And then there remains the, the strong demand on the um, demand side, like pay persons who want to be vaccinated. That still overwhelms the number of appointments that people can get. Yeah, our, our, and I'm not sure, I, I like to think that not everyone is using these computer bots to mm -hmm. book the vaccines, but I just, I can't imagine they're not when our appointments fill in, in eight minutes. Yeah, so that's still. And, and our time has moved from Monday to Wednesday at 10, is it, that correct? It did, our town moved from Monday to Wednesday, and that's really to help be assured of the total, like we, we will already have the vaccine in right. hand. Mm -hmm. So we won't have to reschedule yeah. people or, cause I know that's, if, if it's hard on our end, I can only imagine being the person who made the appointment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Today so there were a lot of college students and faculty at, that came for first doses because a lot of them were asking me outside well for my second dose if I have a class or if I'm teaching what how will and and so there and there were quite a few and there were a couple 16 year olds that came with parents today so were they in there on a comorbidity the 16 year old 
I would imagine I I don't quiz them. No, no, nobody does. So, nobody does. But what? But what? One one young man definitely. Um, yeah. Had comorbidities. Yeah. Um, and I I think the other the other the other. Well, there's one. work work categories too. They get. Yeah, if they're working in a restaurant right. or a supermarket right. or. One of my uh, advisee undergrads, a couple were they were in New York State actually, and one was. One had a job at home delivering food or something like that and in new york where he was that got him in he was going home to get a, a vaccine uh and the other one had another reason why at their home place they were eligible and another yeah, one yeah. of my my faculty colleagues her husband works in connecticut and connecticut does it for if you work there or live there and he, he and they're fully open for all ages so he's getting one in connecticut and he's you know 40 you know yeah like well, John, I will say that Massachusetts, you can be here for work, you could be a resident, you can be not okay, a resident good. for travel. Yeah. We don't need any verification of, um, of, of, of status. Huh. Um, yeah, we, we yeah really this happened to be, be yeah. this happened to be the age. Ah, uh, I see, right. yeah. Right. In other words, he worked in Connecticut, so he was eligible there, and they were open to his age group versus yeah, being they're open to, uh, this as of this week to all ages in Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. yeah but how far in advance can you can you be assured of a supply? Is it just one week at a time? So we we got um, from Jana Ferguson an ex expected. <laughs> yeah, we don't know until we have it, Steve. <laughs> um, so the truck rolls it's up. not much in advance huh <laughs> yeah. i mean jana ferguson did tell us like this is what we expect you to have for the next three weeks but for me until we have it at this point and then even when we get it sometimes it has to be reallocated to a different location um wow that's happened to us before so maybe i'm just a little nervous i don't know Gun shy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, my wife Leslie was working at the Whitney Center in Bay State last week, and they over. She had a, a, a eight hour day or nine or ten that became twelve or something. <laughs> um, oh wow! Because they had they had a bunch of extra extra do you know dose. They, anyway, there were the line was out the door for hours. Wow. Oh geez, that's great. Although it's tiring. Which is good. <laughs> Other questions for Emma? Did we interrupt you and let you finish your report, Emma, or did we start asking away too much? No, no, you the questions more. were good because I was talking about adverse reactions to vaccines and that was really the end of it. So, but thank you for thinking of that, John. <sighs> yes, I was gonna ask anything X else on other than COVID that you wanted to report on, Emma. Um, I. I know that last time I was talking about some grants. Um, mm -hmm. I did reach out to the state about the CDC grant. They're very, um, they're in their higher echelons also thinking of applying, which is what we would be underneath them um, as a sub applicant. That's not the right term, but um, they're still looking into that, which that would be about health equity in response to COVID. Uh, I know on previous um, environmental justice reports, I'm, Amherst has 35% of our population. Um, we have the highest environmental justice population in all of Hampshire County for needs. Um, I think that there's a lot that we could do for our community that needs us. Um, we have a lot of um, English, English isolation as well as individuals of color um, that I just really don't want to be mit forgotten. I really want, um, I know my focus to kind of transition um, a little bit more, not just on distributing it of the vaccine and equity that way, but thinking about um, the impacts of COVID beyond just vaccine. Um, within our community. Mm -hmm. So more with that. 
Do you have any questions, any more questions for Emma or anything else, Emma, before we move on? I'm pretty good. Okay, so topics not anticipated by the chair. I have two things. One is, um, I know Lisa Brewer because of her email and because of the Dylan, I know the town is interested in opening up a cannabis cafe along with home delivery. So we might wanna decide if we wanna write any cannabis regulations. Um, I can reach out to Cheryl and DJ, Cheryl Sabara mm -hmm. who's, and DJ Wilson and ask them for any advice on where we should go from there. What are your thoughts? Are there any state regulations about these issues? It's all being developed. Mm -hmm. And I looked online, the place where cannabis cafes are, the city of Los Angeles has capped it at eight and they have <laughs> one, they have one open one and a second one opening. And the one that's open, there is some inhalation, but it's mainly these gourmet cooks who are developing gourmet meals that have cannabis in the food. Whoa. <laughs> so, and I could not find any other cannabis cafe. So that's for another discussion, but do we want to look into that area? That's why I sort of brought up the smoking things, what, three years ago, knowing cannabis is coming down the track. Um, what are your feelings on that? One, one issue certainly is if people are consuming away from their home, they're going to have to travel probably by car. And so I think that raises a major issue there that you don't have when you're just buying it and then consuming it at home. Yes, I fully agree, Steve. Uh, Maureen, John, or Tim, do you and have The other thing is the, the things in the air, if it is being smoked or vaporized, is not, you know, it's not just, you know, THC right. or whatever. So that's an issue. Right. That's a health um, issue, yes. The same kind of indoor air pollution issues. That Correct. Okay, we're, we're all on the same wavelength here. But Tim, um, <laughs> do you have any thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are, I think uh, we don't have much information yet, you know, so, so whatever step we make, you know, it should be some sort of based on evidence, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. And John, and that's the problem because it's been illegal. There's no, there's very little scientific evidence out there. There is that one professor at the University of Massachusetts who we in public health, I can't remember her name, but I think Steve, you were at that presentation we went to. Um, she is a resource we could reach out to to get uh, more of the, the state of the art science mm -hmm. on cannabis. And John, do you have any thoughts? Oh boy, uh, I think it's a public health issue being driven by income, by money. And, um, yeah. and I wish <laughs> that the health would drive it versus that, but that's, you know, I, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about the 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 whole thing um, mm -hmm. every time I drive down University Drive. Um, <laughs> so Marijuana um, Avenue. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, cool. but I, I'm, I think that, that, yeah, it's a developing issue. We should be on top of it and the front of it. And, and uh, the, as a board, but we have been historically as a town and a board. Um, uh, what fraction of cannabis intake is by inhalation of, of smoke anymore? I have no idea, but my guess is it's not large, but I don't know. I just given so many other ways to intake, uh, you know? Well, as a board, when it first opened, we wanted to have education uh, required for first time buyers. And we wanted to have lock sure. boxes available. And Jeff Kravitz was working on all that. And then Jeff Kravitz moved to Sunderland and all that left, it all went into licensing and we haven't had anything um, to do with it. So- What do you mean lock boxes? Uh, for edibles, so that if oh. you have edibles, so that children or one, one thing that research is coming out with, veterinarians have seen a huge increase in vet visits because animals have been eating uh, marijuana. Of course they have. <laughs> I mean, come 
No kidding. Yeah. Because it's, it hasn't been safely kept any place and the animals have been eating it. So um, pretty expensive dog food. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we should put it on the agenda and, and uh, I'll reach out to Cheryl and DJ to see what's happening. And then the other thing that um, Emma mentioned is for the health department and for the Board of Health to move forward, looking at equity, looking at needs, looking at hidden populations, one thing as a public health nurse and from a public health background, it is important to have a community assessment, which is pretty involved. And for if we ever wanted our board of health, I mean, our health department to be accredited, you need a, um, a community assessment. I've reached out to faculty at the School of Public Health. And I also know faculty because there's a uh, doctor of nursing practice in public health at the College of Nursing, although that's primarily online, where we could possibly get um, graduate students to help us do a, a community assessment. What are your thoughts on that? I, like a, I get really excited about it. But... To start. <laughs> okay. Okay. I just wanted to, I, I put out the feelers and I just, uh, and that's part of my, I mean, I've done community assessments. And when I was teaching at Elms after 9-11, I had a lot of students work on solid pieces of um, uh, community assessments for their emergency preparedness plan. So um, I, I've done them there. And so I'll, I'll reach out and see where we can go with that. But if we can get graduate students who help us do it, because it's very long, very involved. Um, but if they can do that for a capstone course or something, hey, real benefit and so will they. So I'll continue to reach out on that then. That's all I have. Any other comments or questions? No? We can close the meeting then. Second Thursday, May 13th. May 13th. Okay. Exciting. You only have two more meetings, John. Maybe we can have a party when you leave. Not that we want you to leave, but to recognize your work. Maybe we can just be glad that we can might like, see each other yeah, all together nice. in person. Yeah. I hope you get vaccinated soon, Tim. Oh, I am. I'm all done. I'm good. No, but Tim hasn't. Tim hasn't, right? Tim's now. the only one who hasn't been. Yeah. May thirteenth may be challenging for me, but I'll I'll see. Um, depends on timing. We've got I've got to I've got to run a, a, a graduation celebration event virtual for my undergraduates that day, and there's a graduate event anyway. And the thirteenth and fourteenth are crazy days, but um, okay. we'll see what we can do. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that one's out of my control. <clears throat> Well, it's in my control, but there's a lot of constraints. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of okay. constraints. Yeah. Well, thanks, everyone. Can I have a motion to close the meeting? I move we adjourn our meeting today. Second. I'll second. Hey, Maureen. Okay. Moved and seconded. Maureen. Aye. Tim. Aye. Steve. Aye. John. Aye. Nancy. Aye. I just go by the order our pictures are on. Yeah, my they change. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful month. And we'll see you on Zoom or volunteering at the clinic. Thanks, everybody. Thank yeah. you very much, Emma. Uh, thank yes, you, Emma. Bye. Bye, 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 guys. Bye. See ya.